All right, strap in. I got a lot of books to get through. Big stack. Nearly killed me a second ago. Gonna go from the top down. I think I read 19 books this month, which I actually don't believe. Like, I'm looking at them and I'm like, yeah, 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 I, I remember that one and that one and all of them, but I don't actually believe it. Let's go. This is How You Lose the Time War by Amal El Mohtar and Max Gladstone. I made a video about this and I called it a perfect novel and then tried to justify that statement, which, yeah, I think I did a pretty good job of that. This is How You Lose the Time War is a 200 page science fiction epic. And to try and make an epic 200 pages is pretty ambitious, and they did it. But what's amazing about this is that on its surface, it is a pretty convoluted, at least at first, science fiction novel with lots and lots of world building, really trippy time travel mechanics, and two warring factions that are trying to control time itself. There's a lot to take in, but at its core, it's a love story about two agents from opposing factions who are the best at what they do. They are two incredible agents for the battle of time and they fall in love. They start sending each other letters and those letters are kind of playful taunts at first until one of them reveals that she's kind of sick of this war and being used as a tool for it. And she confesses that to her enemy. And then they go back and forth and gently over time they start falling in love. After I made the video, people explained in my comments that the two characters who are our two protagonists that fall in love were each written and handled by the two co-authors of the novel, which I think is really, really cool. And it's also half epistolary because it's half written in letters between the two. And it covers so much. You go from a far-flung future planet where there's a war going on between things in giant Gundam-style mech suits, and then you'll go back to, like, Plato's Greece or Shakespeare's England. But because there are multiple timelines through multiple dimensions, it might be a slightly different Plato or Shakespeare than you're used to. And all of this is covered in 200 pages. What the hell? It's amazing. When do I put this? Oh my god. Floor. Next up is a coffee stained book, which I think adds some charm to it. I made the stains. This is Second Place by Rachel Cusk. I'll be doing a video on this very soon. This is my first Rachel Cusk novel, and it won't be my last. I've wanted to read her for quite a while, and this is the book that I've had my eye on because her other three novels are a trilogy, and this is not. This is a standalone novel, and I really, really admire it. I think if ever you're trying to explain the concept of literary fiction to someone and what that pretty obscure genre is, this is a perfect example. A story and a plot and a series of characters that all represent themes and ideas. Everything that happens in this novel is about the themes that Cusk is trying to convey. The characters represent certain struggles, certain feelings, certain experiences. Everything is grander than it appears. It's a very intimate tale about a woman who falls in love with the art of an artist that she stumbles upon one day in Paris. She goes back home to this marshy land on the English coast with her husband, and 15 years go by, they've had a kid, blah blah blah, and she ends up writing to the artist and saying, hey, do you wanna come and live in our house for a while? And you could maybe paint the local scenery because I'm a big fan of your work. And he does, he eventually comes to their house and hangs out there and he brings his young girlfriend slash protege slash arm candy with him, and at first it feels like it's a kind of don't meet your heroes story, but it's bigger than that. Emotionally, thematically, it's bigger than that. It's about 200 pages. It's written kind of as a letter-ish, just as a framing device, and the language is absolutely beautiful. There were two authors I had in mind while I was reading this that I kept comparing it to, and they were Kazuo Ishiguro. Thematically, I felt like she was dealing with big themes in the way that he does, and Virginia Woolf. It has the poetic and sometimes surrealist linguistic qualities of a Virginia Woolf novel. So if you smush together Kazuo Ishiguro and Virginia Woolf, you get Rachel Cusk. 
This is one I finished recently and I'll also be doing a video on this, Anatomy, A Love Story by Dana Schwartz. This is another novel that was recommended to me by my friend and patron Andy. Andy recommended Idle Burning that I did a video on recently and I'll talk about in a second. And then they also recommended this, so Andy's taste is just fantastic. I'm begging them to start a booktube channel of their own, I really hope they do soon. Anatomy is awesome. It's set in Edinburgh in the early 19th century. And it's basically, what if Frankenstein was a romance? That's probably what I'll title the video. Actually, that sounds great. It tells the story of the daughter of a really wealthy family in Edinburgh. Dad's gone off to fight in the Navy, I think. Mum is mourning the fact that our protagonist lost her older brother recently to this horrible virus, this plague that went around. I actually don't know if that plague was real or not. I should probably look that up before I make that video. And our protagonist, she wants to be a doctor, a surgeon. She's obsessed with bodies and disease and death and healing. She wants to be a doctor, but there are no women doctors at this time. And she ends up befriending this guy who is a resurrection man, which basically means a grave digger that steals dead bodies, but doesn't loot the grave. So. Technically, they're not doing anything illegal because they're not stealing the valuables that the person was buried with, just the body itself. And then they end up selling it to a university or someone else for, you know, medical studies and advancements and blah blah blah. So there's lots of grave digging in here. And our protagonist, she wants to be a doctor, so she needs bodies to study and practice on. And the two of them are obviously gonna fall in love, it's called A Love Story. I won't tell you any more because I'll do a video on it soon, but this is great kind of has a YA vibe to it. Andy called it YA. I think it straddles the line between sort of adult gothic and YA gothic. It's pretty gross at times, so I'm not really sure, but I loved it. This is Teeth in the Back of My Neck. It's a poetry collection, a feminist poetry collection by Monica Radojevic, and wow, this is angry poetry. I think in my last wrap up, I talked about a feminist poetry collection that kind of disappointed me, and now I've forgotten what it was called. The Princess Saves Herself in This One by Amanda Lovelace, that's right. And I said that that collection, as she gets happier, <laughs> as she falls in love and grows up and becomes a happier person, the poetry gets less fierce, less intense, less angry, and therefore less interesting. This is not that. This stays angry the whole time. This is a very aggressive collection of feminist poetry. The language is surreal and evocative. It's the kind of language that sparks really strange, sometimes twisted, sometimes exciting imagery in your mind, just as good poetry should. It really feels like it lights up your brain, it lights up your imagination. Some of the poems are very explicit and clear, others are more interpretative, and you might actually disagree on which ones are which, which ones are obvious to you and which ones you don't really get but you like the vibe and the feeling. It's a mix of the two. You will read a poem and go, okay, I know exactly what that's about. That's about domestic abuse or some other patriarchal poisonous thing. And other times you might go, I'm not really sure what she's getting at here, but I like the emotion, I like the vibe. And that's really cool. It's not so surrealist all the way through that you don't get what's going on, but it's also not so clear cut that there's no room for interpretation. And it is so angry. Love it. Uh, this is a review copy. I reviewed this book recently. You can go watch my video review. This is How Kyoto Breaks Your Heart. It's a memoir slash essay collection by Florentina Lowe, who is a Malaysian-born writer who studied in London and now has lived in Tokyo and Kyoto. She currently lives in, I think, Tokyo. And this is about three years that she spent living in Kyoto. It's about her job there, where she worked as a tour guide. It's about the fact that she had a heartbreaking friendship with a strange person who ended up just letting her down and disappointing her. And it's about her connecting with the city and starting to feel like she belongs there and that the city is opening up its arms to her and accepting her. It's really beautiful and if you want to know more, check out my video. Also, it's published by The Emma Press, who are a very small indie publisher in the UK. They do great work. Please go support them. Check out their website, check out their store, pick this up and shop around. I also did a video on this. This is my first Octavia E. Butler novel, Kindred. I've meant to read Octavia Butler for years. It is one of my great mistakes, my great sins as a big bookworm and book critic and booktuber and all that. I never read Octavia Butler and I felt like a moron. I felt stupid. I felt like I was doing myself 
a massive disservice. And that turned out to be true because Octavia Butler is incredible. And all the wasted years I spent not reading her. Kindred is a science fiction time travel tale that deals with patriarchy and race and American history. The bleak, patriarchal, racist history of the United States. The fact that all the years of American history are stained with the blood of women and black people. And this book explores all of that. She was a black author who was writing in the 70s. This novel is set in 1976, it begins there, but then our protagonist is thrown back in time to the life of her ancestors in the early 19th century, I think 1915, where she is kind of obligated to protect one of her white ancestors, a slave owner who ended up having a kid with one of his slaves, and thus begins her family tree, kind of. And she has to go back and protect him because he keeps almost dying, he's really clumsy. And she watches him grow up every time she's thrown back in time, and the guy becomes pretty monstrous and twisted. This is a novel about patriarchy and white supremacy. It's a sympathetic novel in certain ways. There is a sense of hope tied into it, which I really appreciate. It's not quite as bleak as I'm making it out to seem. Go watch my video, learn more about it. You've probably already read Kindred. I mean, everyone's read Kindred. It's massive and with very, very good reason. It's it's really phenomenal. And I'm gonna be reading The Parable of the Sower pretty soon. I've got that. I'll be reading it as soon as possible. That might be next month. It might be a year from now. I have a lot of books. Another book I also did a video on is Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. This is the first in an eco-science fiction trilogy, and I haven't read the other two yet. I've been told that you don't have to, you can kind of stop at the end of this one, and then I read it, and that kind of turns out to be true. The mystery is intact, it's a very mysterious Lovecraftian kind of a thing. Big, strange ideas about unknowable stuff. And I probably will read the rest of the trilogy, and I'll certainly be reading more of his books, because Vandermeer really writes in a very unique way. In a way that is pretty linear and clear and succinct, and yet there is such a mystery wrapped around it. You kind of feel when you read his writing, and also read the story, that you're walking down a path, and you can see a few feet in front of you, and a few feet in every direction, but then beyond that is just fog. It's just fog, and as you keep walking, the path opens up, but the fog closes in behind you. And so you're always surrounded by the same amount of space. And beyond that is a wall of fog in every direction. That's kind of how the novel feels. And his writing supports that, which is really cool. The fact that our protagonist has no name. She's the biologist, and she's in a group of other people who are also called the job name, the role. They're a group of people who are the 12th expedition into a strange area of the United States where some sort of ecological disaster happened. This area is twisted and strange. Weird things happen there. Every group that goes in there, a different thing happens to them. They might get diseased, they might go insane and kill each other. Lots of different stuff happens. And we're on the 12th expedition out there. And a lot of weird things go on. There is a creature in there that may be extraterrestrial that is doing weird things. There is a building that tunnels down into the earth and they go down there to see what's in there. It's weird and trippy and I should have read it a few years ago. It's very Lovecraftian, but it's also an eco-novel with some interesting environmental themes and ideas going on. Check out my video if you want to know more of my kind of hypotheses about this novel. I will be doing a video on this at some point. I have planned another witch video. I've done a few videos on witch books in the past. I have a massive article of 20 plus books about witches. I read a lot of books about witches, fiction and non-fiction, and I'll be adding that to a new video soon, and also maybe a new video on modern feminist non-fiction that I've been reading that has been inspiring. Third wave, trans-inclusive, intersectional feminism. And this is one of those books. This is In Defense of Witches by Mona Cholet. She's a Swiss writer who writes in French, and this was translated by Sophie R. Lewis. They named the translator on the cover. Always love that. Well done, Picador. Picador, always great. This is a book in four sections, and each section talks about the modern feminist experience, the modern woman, and how it relates back to the witch trials. I find that really, really interesting. The title and subtitle talk about witch trials, but it's not just a history of witches, far from it. It's about modern feminism, 21st century women, 
and it relates back when necessary to the witch trials. And each of the four sections of the book focuses on something different. So for example, one of those sections is about motherhood and our obligation or lack of obligation to have children. And it's not just about women. You could also relate this to fathers as well. It talks about the world right now and the way that society frames motherhood and the importance of having children and the ways in which a woman is defined by her ability to carry a child and raise a child and be a mother and all of this toxic bullshit. That's one chapter, and then there's three others, and I'll talk about it more when I do a full video, but I found this really, really enlightening. Okay, here are two books that I didn't finish. <laughs> the first is Sleeping Giants by Sylvain Nouvelle. I had this book on my list of things I wanted to get to at some point for years, since the day it came out. I saw it on a shelf in a bookshop. I can still remember seeing it and reading the blurb and going, whoa, this sounds amazing. And I finally got it and I, I read it and I got halfway and I got bored. And I'm really annoyed because it's science fiction. It's a really compelling mystery and it's epistolary. It's written as a series of diary entries and interviews with some mysterious government figure. The protagonists who are being interviewed are a scientist who made a discovery when she was a child and a few military personnel who were involved in helping figure out this mystery. The mystery being that our protagonist, when she was a little girl, she ran away from home and she fell into a pit and at the bottom of that pit was a massive metal hand and she's just sitting in the palm of this hand being cradled by it and we quickly figure out that this is extraterrestrial by design. It's made of a metal that is extraordinarily rare, and there's no way that anyone in the past could have gathered up enough of this metal to make a big hand. And then more body parts start to get discovered, and when the torso is discovered pretty early on, they realize that it might in fact be a ship, because the torso is hollow, and a person could fit inside to drive it. So it's some sort of extraterrestrial ship, that was dismantled and the pieces were spread across the entire planet. They find the hand in the United States, they find the forearm in Turkey, I think, and as it goes on. But by the halfway point, I just forgot why I cared and I realized that I was sort of just not really reading and just sort of scanning through it almost and I thought, huh, it looks like I don't care. I actually surprised myself. I just didn't care anymore, so I stopped. Sorry. The other book I DNF'd is The House in the Cerulean Sea. Now, this really surprised me. Everyone loves this book. TJ Klune is a bit of a queer hero at the moment. His books are very imaginative. I read exactly half of this book and then I had a review copy that I had to get to. I had a book that had a deadline and I had to review it. So it was a big 500 page book. I'll talk about it in a second. And so I went to that and I read that and I reviewed that. And when that was done, I just didn't want to go back to this. I was like, ah, it was all right, but I'm kind of done. It's a queer fairy tale inspired modern urban fantasy style thing set in a world where there are orphanages spread around and these orphanages house children who have special abilities. And there's this guy who is really, really bland and boring, who works for a kind of government agency that visits these orphanages and checks that they're kind of up to code and that the kids aren't too dangerous. Doesn't think about his job, doesn't think about how it might actually be really corrupt, what happens to the kids. He is, you know, a beige office worker who doesn't think too deeply about anything. He's like Colin Robinson from the uh, What We Do in the Shadows TV show. <laughs> but he goes to this island with one of these orphanages on it where one of the kids is literally the son of the devil, literally, and all the other kids are pretty gnarly too. And as far as I understand, it's a romance between our protagonist and the man who is the orphanage's headmaster. So it's a gay romance, but I didn't actually get far enough for the romance to really kick in. And I would have finished it if I hadn't stopped myself, if I hadn't you know, had something else to go and do. I would have finished it. But by the time I got back to it, about five or six days later, I just couldn't find enough of a reason, a compulsion to finish it. So I just didn't. Sorry. Another incredible poetry collection that I read again, a feminist poetry collection, is Witch by Rebecca Tamas. Holy Jesus God. This is another very angry, very trippy, surrealist feminist collection. It kind of has a narrative. Our protagonist is a witch who lives for hundreds of years. 
and every poem details something that she gets up to. And one of the things she does early on is enter a very sexual relationship with the devil himself. I think I'm gonna do a video on all of these great feminist poetry collections, and I might need to reread some of this in order to actually make that a decent enough video. But I was enthralled by this. The poems take a few rereads because they are incredibly surreal in what happens and how certain elements, imagery, events within the poems might be metaphorical or they might not and what are the themes, what is it getting at, what is the point of the poem. There's a lot of that, you can kind of overthink it. I think if you're not very confident with reading poetry, if poetry intimidates you, and that's the case for so many of us, it definitely used to be the case for me, still kind of is sometimes, this might not be for you, because you're going to read it and go, but what does this mean? And you'll overthink it and you'll stress yourself out. And when you stop doing that, and you just ride the waves, it gets a lot better and it's, really, really powerful and pretty gnarly. Idol Burning is a fantastic Japanese novel that I read recently. I again did a video on it. It is about idol culture in Japan. An idol punches a fan in the face and our protagonist is one of his stans who is obviously shocked by this and it rocks her entire world and the novel explores her life as an idol stan, his life as an idol, her relationship to him, Obviously she doesn't actually know him, but the way that he impacts her life and gives her life purpose and meaning as a pretty boring high school girl who doesn't have a lot of her own shit going on. I really, really enjoyed it. It's tiny, it's really short, it's like 120 pages. I read it in an afternoon and I absolutely adored it and I'm so glad that I didn't miss out on it. This was the other novel that was recommended to me by my friend and patron, Andy. I'm so grateful, it's, it's brilliant. It's also translated by Asa Yoneda, who is a great translator, and this must have been quite tough to translate because of the sort of modern slang of idol culture. There's so many terms used by idol stands that I don't understand, and it's all in here translated brilliantly and relevant to English. Great translation, great book. A Good House for Children. I reviewed this. I loved it to pieces. I thought it was a fantastic modern gothic twisted haunted house story, but go check out my review if you want a lot more details. This was written by Kate Collins, who's an absolute sweetheart, and it's a story where the haunting isn't really the point. It's set in a single house where there is a dual narrative. Set 50 years apart, you've got two different groups of residents in a single house. The people who lived there in the 70s, and the people who live there in the modern day, and the way that both of these groups of people are being haunted by the house, and the focus is on children, what the house does to children. And thematically, it's a novel that explores the burden of parenthood and what parenthood asks of us, what it takes from us, what we are forced to provide as parents, if we are, I'm not, I'm not a parent, but if you are a parent, what you must give of your life to another life. While also being a really, really fun and creeping haunted house story, there are some chapters and moments in here that really send a shiver through you. So it's very effective. The dialogue is a highlight for me. The dialogue in this novel is very electrifying. This is my favorite novel of the year so far, and honestly, one of the best novels I've ever, ever read. In Ascension by Martin McInnes. Please go check out my video on this if you haven't already. I poured my soul into talking about this book. It's an incredible literary science fiction epic that I would say is closely connected to 2001 A Space Odyssey in terms of its themes and ideas and just how epic and grand a scale it's on. I was blown away by this. It's incredible. You've got a woman from the Netherlands who is a micro slash marine biologist who begins by going out on an excursion on a ship to discover what life might live inside a deep sea thermal vent. And eventually she ends up heading out into the furthest reaches of our solar system to discover something else. This novel takes us from the beginnings of life to the furthest possible reaches of life, as well as the place where life began on Earth to where Earth might end up in the future. And it does all of that from a single perspective and it works. It's science fiction, but it's also an intense personal drama. Thematically, it is so beautiful. It is tackling that age-old idea that we are all made of star stuff. It's 
an enthralling and enlightening story about life itself, where we come from, what we're made of, what our purpose is, and how beautifully we are all tied together to each other and to the world around us, through our chemistry, our biology, our history. It's so beautiful. I cannot say enough great things about this book. It's perfect, it's amazing. I love In Ascension so, so much. Clytemnestra is now my favourite Greek mythology retelling. It is grounded, it is angry, it is dark and bleak, it is full of really, really triggering events, so be warned, there's a lot of stuff that I can't say without getting demonetized. So go in knowing that it might be too much for you, so maybe don't go in <laughs> if it'll be too much for you, but I would say that in terms of its themes and its characters and its plotting, pacing, writing, everything, this is the best new Greek mythology retelling. This beats out everything else that I've read from Natalie Haynes, Jennifer Saint, Madeline Miller. I really think this is amazing. And it's also a debut novel. Constanza Cassati has done something really incredible here by retelling the story of the woman who was married to the monstrous tyrant Agamemnon and what she went through and the way that she allowed her trauma to fuel her anger and her revenge. Incredible, unmissable. Check out my video on it. I love this book. This is another book that I am going to add to that new feminist book list. The Feminist Killjoy Handbook by Sarah Ahmed. Sarah Ahmed is a modern feminist philosopher who is quoted constantly on the channel Philosophy Tube. Abigail Thorne loves this woman. Sarah Ahmed is mentioned constantly in every single Philosophy Tube video, so I thought, right, I need to actually get on it and read her. And luckily, this brand new book of hers just came out. And it's all about what a feminist killjoy is, who she is, where she came from, whether or not you are one or you could be one, and what that means in the wider patriarchal societal discourse that we live in right now, especially in the West. Chapter upon chapter that just explores what it means to be a feminist killjoy, the responsibilities of that, the role that it plays and the importance of who she is. It's fantastic, very relatable, it's feminist philosophy, but very light, very anecdotal almost. I was really enthralled by it. It made me laugh, it made me feel a sense of righteous anger, it felt motivating, and it's also wonderfully intersectional. It constantly talks about transphobia and homophobia. Sarah Ahmed herself is a mixed race, British, lesbian feminist who has friends who are non-binary, transgender, and so she's incredibly intersectional and inclusive when she talks about the relationship between feminism and race and sexuality and gender. It's brilliant. She talks a lot about racism, she talks a lot about different religions and cultures, and she talks a lot about the intersectionality of different genders and sexualities. It's, it's brilliant. Infinity Gate by M. R. Carey. At the time of recording, my last video was about this book. Yes, my review is up now. Go check it out. It's the video before this one. This is a great book. It's an incredible science fiction epic. So much happens in it that it's it's quite dizzying. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm gonna leave this. Go watch my newest video. It probably needs a few views, so you know, go watch that. But M. R. Carey's an amazing writer. I've been a fan of his comics for years. The Girl with All the Gifts is an amazing novel that I've also talked about in a video. And this is the first half of an incredible duology about multiverse. Multiverse is everywhere right now. The MCU, blah, blah, blah. Everyone's talking about multiverses. This does it best. This is the best multiverse story that science fiction has ever seen, I promise. Finally, just quickly, the last book that I wanna talk about is the LGBTQ plus history book. And the reason I wanna talk about this is because I am that book's audiobook narrator. I am so happy to talk about this. I'm gonna make a video where I review the book, and I'm also gonna make a video where I talk about the fact that this is a new job of mine, but I recently got myself an agent at Spoken For. I'm so happy, <laughs> I, I can't say how happy I am that I am finally an audiobook narrator. I have wanted to do this job since I was a kid, and this is my first audiobook, is the LGBTQ plus history book. It's an enormous encyclopedic, coffee table style book that deals with global history of queerness. It is massive. There is so much covered here. 
I'm so proud of this book, it's beautiful, and I'm so happy that I'm the audiobook narrator. I will be talking about it very soon, and I will also talk about the experience and, and how happy I am that I'm an audiobook narrator, but oh, I'm overjoyed, I really am. Every moment that I spend in the studio recording this is a dream, it's a gift, I'm so grateful to my agent, and I'm so happy that this is my new job, and I'll talk about it more soon. But check out the LGBTQ plus history book when it's out, and of course, get the audiobook, because it's narrated by me. Okay, that'll do. I actually read a manga, a fantasy manga called Free Run, which I've forgotten to talk about. Just pretend I did. It's a really, really charming fantasy manga. Check out some of these books. I'm a narrator now. <laughs> Join my Patreon. If you want to support me, I would really appreciate it, and subscribe for books.